one. Hi, everybody. This is Paul Casey, Campo Karate Hall of Fame education video series. Today, we are truly honored to uh, celebrate some greatness. This gentleman is highly decorated a uh, police officer. He has a black belt in several different systems. Uh, he is also a member of the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame. The only thing exceeded by his accomplishments and talent is him as a human being. He cares truly about the people that he trains with, those that he knows. And so I'm going to introduce you to Mr. Ron Sanchez. Ron, welcome to the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame, sir. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Excellent. We're going to uh, we're going to dive into some questions here, and uh, I'm going to go right off the bat with the first thing I'm going to ask you about. You have written a book. This is the book, folks, and as you can see, I have spent some time with this book. It's called The Watchman. It came out in 2016. Ron wrote this, and he wrote it from the perspective of uh, how he felt spiritually, and then he delved into a little bit long, uh, further, and he calls it 12 Irrefutable Principles of Physical and Spiritual Defense. And we're going to cover a lot of this. It, there's a lot of reference in this book to real practical application from his law enforcement background. He's also done evaluations of, of situations that have occurred between police officers and uh, criminals. And, but he uses it from the perspective of looking at how to assist us the general public so that won't have these kind of victims that we can be by not paying attention. Right off the bat, he says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, 1 Peter 5, 8. He also has a quote, which I liked, which is on page 63, and it relates to the title of this book. It is, but if the watchman sees the sword coming, and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, and the sword comes and takes someone's life, that person's life will be taken because of their sin. But I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. Ezekiel 33, 6. These spiritual quotes, passages, resonate with everyone. And think about what is written here. This comes from a greater power. So let's get into the history of why you wrote this book and your life and your journey in the martial arts. Captain Sanchez, tell us about it. Well, I wrote the book because it's just kind of the accumulation of much of my life's work, to be honest with you. Um, there's a lot of books on, on, on self-defense and combat mindset and urban survival, but I didn't see any um, that I thought were all encompassing in that they left out the spiritual aspect of self-defense and how that interplays and intertwines. And so in my decades of, of being a, a police officer, I worked surveillance and undercover and narcotics. And you start, I started seeing patterns in, in how um, people become victimized and how predators pick their victims. And I thought that it was going to be benefit to the martial arts world to be able to get that out. You know, there's a lot of great studios in, in, in the country and in the world, but I hadn't been exposed to anybody um, that delved really deeply into who a predator is, how they function, what they do, and then how our body functions, how our soul functions when we're underneath pressure, when we're, when we're being assaulted. And the, the other thing that really stuck out to me is in martial arts and in pretty much any combat sport, we have a, a beginning. You know, and so we don't really learn how to manage the assault before the assault. So, you know, generally we'll get in a ring and, and karate and we'll bow, or in, in jiu-jitsu they run out and they shake hands, or in wrestling they do the same thing, and then a referee says to begin, and then they know this is the time for the fight to begin or the assault to begin. And in real life, it doesn't function that way. So I wrote a, a lot of the book focuses on um, pre-incident indicators and how you manage an assault before it begins. I, I hadn't seen that, so I kind of wanted to write something to fill, to fill what I thought was a gap. You know, it's funny it, 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 that you brought that up about the thinkings of how the victims react and how they think. And, you know, it's, there's a part of here in your book 
you specifically outline a lot of the considerations that Mr. Parker talks about in Infinite Insights, but you use a more practical approach from the layman. And I think the number one thing that I come out right off the bat is that you have here, you say, predators don't spend a lot of time worrying about police responding, or they're not worrying about that the police call is going to get there. They don't fear the law. They don't fear being prosecuted. They don't fear about anything about weapons. They don't fear about prison. They don't even fear about the death penalty. Why don't you put it into perspective? What should be our mindset? Because you've already laid out the mindset of the evil that wants to hurt you or your family. Yeah, I, I, one of the things that I, that I saw, two things I saw in, in interviewing victims, and there's a part of the book that I talk about um, that I, I talk about the interviews of dead people. And when you interview dead people that were killed in a violent assault, what did they say? What was a common thread that they said happened to them right before they get killed? And then I make a, a, a joke of it, like you don't got to go back and read it. What, what I'm talking about is, is if someone's in a violent assault, and during the assault, they lose consciousness. What happens to them right before they lose conscious, in all likelihood, because you can't really interview dead people, is very similar to people that lose consciousness and never recover. And what I found there was a commonality between those folks is they, they, were, they all said that they hesitated when the pre-assault things started, the pre-assault indicators started to happen. It caught them flat-footed, and they didn't really adjust to the situation that was occurring. And then, then the second thing they said during my interviews of them is they couldn't believe that it was happening to them. So one, they had a hard time assessing what the threat was. And then, then number two, they were in shock. And so that causes lag time. Even in the best trained person, if you don't focus that or make that part of your training, that causes lag time. And a good predator knows to exploit that. And so that's what I was talking about that portion of the book. And it's consistent with the scriptures that you have to be alert to what is happening into our environment around us. The other thing that's really important is do, do we conduct our lives in a way that it desensitizes us to the environment? So am I routinely going out in, in, in public? Am I being aggressive? Am I, am I getting loud? Am I tailgating people? Am I getting involved in road rage? Is there a level of, of intoxication that, that I shouldn't have when I'm out in public? You know, am I desensitizing myself to what's occurring around me by my, by my behaviors? And then am I unnecessarily drawing attention to myself? Because if we draw attention to ourselves, we're going to draw both good and bad attention. And then if we're confronted with that, do we know how to assess? Do we know how to make assessment of changes in our environment when those assessments could be potentially dangerous for me? When you're talking with uh, the layman, not the martial artist, but the layman, do you actually set it out to be aware of your environment? Be aware that there's some bad people out there. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, to, 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 it doesn't matter who you're speaking to, whether it's martial artist or layman or, or law enforcement. Law enforcement officers, because of the nature of their work, they instinctively know that because that's their job to go after those people, at least part of their job. Um, but yeah, I mean, so you, you, we have. I have a thing where I talk about, it, and it came from a problem solving model called Sarah. So you scan your environment you assess your environment, you make a response to dangerous changes in your environment, and then you reassess your response. So an example would be is if I walk into a bank in the middle of the day, it's warm right now. If I walk into the bank and I'm scanning around in the bank and all of a sudden I look up and I don't see anybody in the bank and it's during business hours, there's something wrong. Or if I'm in the bank and I make a scan and assessment, I see somebody wearing a very long coat and it's 90 degrees outside there's something wrong. And so what am I going to do with that assessment? Most people, frankly, they go in there, they'd be oblivious to it. I even cite a shooting that occurred decades ago with a, with a sergeant in a, in a local department. He walked into a bank and he walks into the bank and he was, he was distracted. So he, his, Jeff, Colonel Cooper calls it condition white where your head is in the cloud. So he was distracted and he walks into the bank and he's looking at his checkbook register and he's walking up and all of a sudden he's mid through the bank and he looks around and he goes, where's everybody at? 
And as he does that, a individual suspect walks past him wearing uh, a athletic suit, a jumpsuit, and that's all he sees. And then he said, when I turned around, I saw, when I turned around, I identified myself as a police officer, I saw the suspect was armed. So A, he was in situational overload because he turned and he identified, he identified himself as a police officer before he, before he had identified what he was looking at. And then when he spun, he saw the guy armed with the gun. And then the other thing I talk about this in the book too, is underneath stress, you'll do as you train. And that's been proven multiple, multiple times in law enforcement and the military. And this sergeant, and God bless him for it, he, he got shot by the suspect. But when he draws, when he goes to draw his gun, he can't get his gun out of the holster and he continues and continues to try to draw. And you see the video of the suspect slowly come up with a 357 Magnum and shoots the sergeant from a distance of about six feet and he survived. And a 357 Magnum is, is actually has one of the highest stop rates of any handgun. Um, and when they interviewed him later, they said, why couldn't you get your gun out of the holster? Because they checked the holster and there was nothing wrong with it. And he admitted that when he would go to the range for 20 years to qualify, as he would walk out on the range to shoot, in order to save a little bit of time when the target's turn, he would unsnap his holster. So for his whole career, every time he went to draw, every time he went to draw his weapon, he never had to unsnap his holster because he'd already done that. So now when he gets underneath fight or flight and he's in defense of his life, what does he do? He reaches for his firearm as he always has. He starts drawing it, but he can't get it out of the holster and he ends up being shot and he survived. So and that's somebody that's been through a significant amount of training. So it's really important that when we train, we have a realistic assessment of how we're training. You know, in martial arts, if we're always training, for example, in point karate and we never push ourselves past that, if we continually stop, at a point. It's just naive to think that if we don't train in other ways, that we're not going to do that when we get in a real situation. So are you telling me we should go out on Friday or Saturday night to the bar and kick people's asses? No, no, I'm not saying that at all. No, I just want to make sure I understand. No, but the realistic thing, I'm going to go right to chapter 12, the most important chapter that you asked me to look at. And I'm going to ask our listeners to pay attention to what I'm going to ask. Uh, Mr. Sanchez. He's got so much experience, so much time understanding this, working also with so many students. And I probably, this is a question that none of us really wants to ask, but I'm going to ask it. Mr. Sanchez, are you ready to die? 98%. You know, truthfully, I have 2% of me that it's always going to be that struggle, you know, until probably the last few breaths or the last few moments. Yeah, but, but 98%. And, and what I talk about in that is, again, as much of the things that I have in there um, come from my personal situations and come from talking with people that I know that have been in similar life and death shootings or been in or life and death situations or been in shootings and had near death experiences, even if it wasn't a violent near death experience. It's a common thing to, you know, you have people say they saw their whole life flash past them in a, in a second, you know, or they go through a sense of remorse or you have unfinished business. Um, and so, you know, we want to live our lives in a way that we're not worried um, as much as possible is what's going to happen if we lose our life, depending on whatever your spiritual walk is or your faith or lack of faith. Um, we want to be have that resolved when we go out. We want to resolve that every day. So when we go out there, we're again getting rid of lag times. So if we're confronted with a life or death scenario, or we end up having to struggle or fight for our lives or defeat somebody for our lives, our focus of attention is in doing exactly that. We're not, we don't have our attention distracted that's why I said predators, and I'm not talking about some drunk or a fool or some idiot. I'm talking about the hardcore predator that goes out and goes out to, to attack. They're, they're, they're generally, they're, their thought is they're either going to hurt you or hurt you and or take your property or, 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 or harm your body and somehow or kill you. And they don't worry, like, like, like you said in the intro, they don't worry about are the police coming? They don't worry about the death penalty. 
I mean, I arrested all sorts of murder suspects that didn't care about the death penalty, and it never enters their mind. They just do what they think they need to do in their head. So they have no lag time. One of the things of us as good people is how do we deal with all those other things that happens to us that don't happen to them? We worry about our wives, our children, our jobs, our reputation, our career. Am I going to use too much force? Am I not going to use enough force? Am I going to be sued? All those things take us away from our primary focus in defeating a predator that's coming after us with great vigor. They're not worried about that. So when that chapter that I have is, are you ready to die? Is and, and the other one I have is know your moral code. What are you willing to fight to the death over? You need to know that before you go out. You know, if you go out and you haven't resolved what you're willing to take all the way into the next life, in the middle of mortal combat, that's not the time to figure it out. And that'll happen if you haven't resolved it. If you haven't resolved that you're pod, that you have the ability to take a life. And all of a sudden, you're in a life or death fight, and you become confronted with that question, and you haven't resolved that, that could cause lag time. So you have to have a moral code that when you go out, you say, what am I willing to fight to the death over? And once you have that moral code, then you have to live by that. And that's easier said than done. You know, that means you don't get to get your ego in the way with some idiot that slammed his brakes on in front of you. That means you don't get to voice your opinion at somebody that flipped you the finger because what if that leads to that next step what if that leads to the cars pulling over what if that leads to the guy getting out of the car and it turns into a vicious fight where you have to really go to the depths of your capabilities to defeat the person and in the back of your mind you want to have that floating around it's like i shouldn't be in this fight this could have been avoided if you do that with the predator you're going to lose because he's not going to be thinking so the other thing is, is if you have to have resolved what your spiritual belief is about the next life. If you know, I'm a Christian, so to me, I start my day off thanking God for waking up. I, I, I pray for the Holy Spirit to guide me, strengthen me, and walk with me um, during that day. And I honor God. And then at night when I go to bed, I repent for any of the mistakes, sins of omission, sins of commission that I've done. And what that does for me is every day when I start my day, I'm not carrying any baggage from the day before. I'm going out with a fresh slate for that day. And I'm going to conduct myself in a way that doesn't draw unnecessary attention to myself. I'm going to do everything in my power to avoid a confrontation or a fight. But if it comes to me and it doesn't leave me a viable option, then I'm going to be very prepared. And because I believe in that moral code, it eliminates the lag time. And then that makes me a much tougher fight. That's interesting you say that. In Parker's book of Infinite Insights, he talks about the awareness, just knowing that there's bad things outside that door that's going to come at you. And I put it in the perspective of saying, my student says, calls it expect the unexpected. I just call it unknown. Because when you walk out there, it is unknown to you what can possibly happen. However, you're being proactive in your thinking of saying, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't engage with that person. But if you do, then you better have a plan. And if you don't have a plan, you're screwed. And then you better have the mindset that I'm going to commitment. That means I'm either going to leave or I'm going to engage. But he who hesitates, right. we know what's going to happen. And finally, the last aspect of it, in my mind, is called execution. And if you execute and you fall through that, and this is, you know, this is through your training. So I know you've been confronted with a life and death situation. We don't need to explore that. Um, that is not a pleasant thought. My brother was a reti he's retired LAPD. Uh, he was involved in two incidents where there was uh, uh, the bad guy died. One was because it was in uh, Hollywood Division, I believe, and uh, it was a serial rapist, and he had the knife to the woman's neck, and he was going to kill her. He started to pull the knife, and Chris had to use the force to take him down. The other one was another situation where a guy jumps out of the second floor at the LAPD station, grabbed him, and he couldn't hold him, and he died. So uh, most of us will never be confronted, I hope, 
with a life or death situation. One time back when I was in my early 20s, I was confronted with a guy with a gun. Thank God it didn't go bad. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here talking to you. So we've already talked about, are you ready to, for, are you ready to die? And if you get that, you have your house straight and you're good with your maker and you do all the right things, when your time comes, your time comes. But let's talk about what we do before that so that we don't have to worry about that situation. And one day we just natural causes. So let's go back through some of these things that you have enumerated in your book. You obviously said we got, you know, obviously a mindset. You need to understand there are bad people. And these, I mean, really bad people, not just the guy, like you said, that uh, cusses you out or flips you out or whatever. But today we're really seeing, sir, a situation, an escalation of people that are extremely emotional and angry and people are getting injured and killed because of this. There is an attitude toward police officers of hatred. I don't know why, because um, they're the ones that are going to come to help you. That's what policemen do. First responders do that. But we can't count on that because the statistics, and I think you'll lay this out, are not in our favor. Am I correct? No, when I mean when I when I looked at the response times when I wrote the book, I, the, the FBI stats that were based on 2015 was dependent on what part of the country you lived in. The response to a priority one red lights and siren call was seven to eleven minutes. Then um, it's it, it's greater now. Um, if if this big national movement to defund police agencies goes through, it will increase. It's just just math. I, I, mean, I don't even get into the politics of it. It's just the math. If there's less available officers to respond to calls, then it, then it will increase. So, you know, I mean, how many of us have been in a seven to 11 minute fight for our life? You know, so that's a long time. And so we have to accept the reality of the situation. You know, I love our police departments, but most of what they do is reactive. It's, it's a reactive response. So if someone assaults you and someone is good enough to call 911, the goal is to get there in seven minutes. That's the goal. And so we have to be able to understand that we're the ones that are responsible for our safety and the safety of our loved ones and the safety of our families. It's, it's just naive to put that on law enforcement because it's just not going to happen. So let's, let's address the issue. So you're confronted. You can't walk away. Let's go to your chapter here, which you talk about is uh, the attack. How do you anticipate that attack? What are you looking for? Well, I mean, there, there are steps that 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 you that that you could take, but the bigger, the most important thing before that is to have a realistic assessment of what your self-defense and survival skills are. And by realistic, I mean what's your physical endurance, what's your muscular strength, what's your aerobic conditioning. Um, there's two things that come into play when you're in for you're in in for a, in fight or flight or in for a fight of your life is one is what's your muscle endurance and this is apart from your skills okay your skills are just a whole other bag so if we assume for a second as a martial artist that we've developed a high level of skills that's good now the next step is is can we apply those skills underneath pressure and then what is our experience base in applying that under pressure so if you were a bodyguard or if you were a bouncer or if you were in the military or if you worked in the correction system or you were a law enforcement officer in, in a busy division, you've probably been exposed to situations that the average person hasn't been exposed to. So you have to say, what is my skills and what is my actual experience? You know, then once, once, you, once you've been truthful with yourself about that, then you got to ask yourself, you know, what's my muscle strength? How strong am I? What's my muscle endurance? You know, how long can I go at, at, a, at, at a high rate of speed? And what's my aerobic conditioning? You know, what, what kind of physical condition am I at? And then you got to do a realistic assessment about your age. I mean, I'm going to be 67 years old in a couple of weeks. So that's very different than if I was 
even 35 or 40 or 45. And so you have to have a realistic assessment of that. So you have your strength, your endurance, your aerobic, and then as you as you become better trained is one for your aerobic conditioning is how big is my tank the next part of it is do i know how to regulate my tank all right by the time we get into a position if we're accomplished black belts and we're really really serious about our study of the martial arts we need to not only have our skill sets but we need to know we need to be confident enough in them and confident enough and what of our assessment of, of ourselves is, is that we learn that there's spots, even in combat, that we can relax. So we learn to be able to take our tank, being our aerobic capacity, we can increase that because we regulate ourselves and how much energy we're going to expend and when we're going to expend that. So that's part of our, of our assessments. If you have somebody that's getting confrontational with you, what you said is you can't walk away, you know? Well, can you? Because if you can walk away, do so. You know, I mean, so there's just, we don't, we shouldn't have anything to prove to ourselves at this level of our training. So, you know, to get in a fight over somebody's mouth at this stage in life is just silly. All right, so can you walk away? But there are situations that occur that we can't walk away. So then we can look at whether or not our opponent, I call them agonistic behaviors, it comes from the animal kingdom, is he displaying certain behaviors in a sequence that we think um, that he's preparing for an assault. And I talk about that in the book, not everybody does it. The, 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 the last, vicious altercation that I got in was 31 years ago, and it was off duty. Um, and the suspect was military trained. He was in the military. He was AWOL. The military had looked for him. He had assaulted an officer. And all the agonistic behaviors that I was going to talk about didn't occur. He didn't display one of them. He drove through a parking lot, slammed on the brakes of his car. I was with my 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 um, now deceased former wife he slammed on the brakes started screaming at her she was also an officer i looked at her and i said you know him have you arrested him and she was i've never seen him before and he bailed out of the car and i ran around the back of the car and the war was on there was never a, a word said the guy was just nuts so you don't know that you're going to get all of these but with most you'll get some. So they do things, you know, they'll scan, like they'll come up with their confrontation, they'll, they'll, sca they'll scan, they'll start looking around. And what are they doing? Is they're looking around to see if you have a, 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 an opponent and they're looking around to see, or a, a, a backup, they're looking around to see if the police officers are there. They get, just as we get, affected by fight or flight or the adrenaline effect. So when that happens, and we, we all know it, so if I'm covering stuff you know, then fine, and if not, then that's great too. When we go underneath fight or flight or the adrenal effect, what happens is the, the blood in our body surrounds our organs. And the reason it does that is to provide extra strength and extra protection for our organs because it's preparing for trauma, all right? When that happens, blood leaves our extremities and it's going into our central core. That causes us to lose some level of motor skills. So when I train my students, I always train them for major muscle movements, all right? Because when we're in fight or flight, you could make major muscle movements, but very fine, intricate movements, the very highly trained people can do that, but most of our students can't, most of our, most black belts can't, because they've never functioned at that level. So if you're underneath fight or fight and you're in the adrenaline effect, your core bread and butter needs to be the major muscle movements because you're going to lose the fine fine motor skills when we lose our motor skills that causes little trembling in our hands sometimes when i used to compete in there was time that i found in i thought darnell garcia must be the middle of the police i had idolized that guy as a competitor for most of my career as a martial artist and now i'm bowed in against him and I remember sitting there going I said man I hope you can't see my hand shaking 
because I said, man, I'm about to fight one of the best fighters in the world. Um, so what happens when we do that is they'll start making larger, or people will make movements. They become animated because they're trying to hide those, those movements. So that's a preemptive indicator. So you can look for changes in speech patterns. When guys get really focused on what they're doing, they'll, sometimes they'll go from being very verbose to what uh, my friend George Ryan calls monosyllable, monosyllabic speech. They'll get to where I'm going, mm hmm yep. You know, that's letting you know that they're getting ready, to, getting ready to focus. You know, I always say look for their hands. If you can't see both of their hands, you have to make an assumption that there's a weapon in one of them. So I always say, where's their hands? Can you see, the, can you see both of their hands? Generally, before an assault is launched, you'll see them blade their stances. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll take a step. Most fighters fight with their strong side back. Not all. Mr. White actually trains most of his guys to fight strong side forward. I don't because I, I'm, I'm frequently almost always armed. I'm right-handed, so my firearm is usually on my right side. So I'm not going to fight right side forward because that means I bring it closer to my opponent. But most fight with their strong side back. So if you can't see their strong side hand, there's a high likelihood that they're trying to secrete a weapon. You certainly have to be uh, cognizant of that. Right before an attack, I saw often, you know, because we would do these surveillances, and I would go out, went out as a decoy before. They'll try to lull you. They'll slow down and they'll go, ah, man, this ain't even worth it. You know, they're trying to get you to drop your guard. You know, and then you'll usually see a pause. Sometimes you'll see a hand turn like they're going to walk away, and then they'll turn and attack. So those are some of the agonistic or the pre-incident behaviors that, that, that you have to be aware of. If you haven't trained yourself to do that and what you're going to do when that happens, because they're not going to bow and say, okay, this fight's going to start in three seconds the last two minutes. If you haven't trained yourself to do that and to control those agonistic behaviors, you're starting off at a gross disadvantage. You know, so when I'm training my students, I tell them, look, try to walk away if you can. You know, I said, try to get out of there if you can. We're not talking about winning a fight. We're talking about survival. So if you can leave, leave. Don't get in a fight over your ego. Ego means edge got out. Don't fight over that. But if you can't leave and you have to stay there, learn how to control and, and to deal with those agonistic behaviors. So if you have a guy that's up in your face, what are you going to do? You right away going to drop him in a karate stance and say, come on? That may not be realistic. Number one, you're telegraphing that you have some skills. And most, most good martial artists that do that, the first time you think they know you, you find out anything about martial arts, they lit you up. All right? So, are, you know, but there's things you can do. If the guy's yelling, you put your hands up and you say, look, calm down. I need you to just calm down. This is going to be okay. Well, what did I do? I'm sorry. I, 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 I've laid in my stance. I've got my hands here. And everybody that's watching me, he's going, he's trying to get them to calm down. But the other thing that is, my hands are already high. See, my hands are already up. You know, I'm not doing this, but they're already up. So if he throws, I, I got my hands here. I'm already ready to go. So are we training our students to do, to manage the fight before the fight occurs? Most we don't. Most of the time we get up and we bow and we say, ready, begin. And so that has to be part of our training. You come up in the second part of your assessment here in looking at the attack. You talk about fear management and alertness conditions. And you give us three conditions. Condition three, relax. Condition two, specific alertness. Condition one, targeted alertness. Can you explain yeah. those? Yeah, so three, three is, is, is you're relaxed, but you're paying attention to what's going on around you. So you're, you're scanning your environment and you're making, you're recognizing changes in your environment and you're assessing it. So if I walk into the store, I'm relaxed, but I know that there's an entrance here and an exit over there and I scan and I see who's in there. If somebody comes in, I see who's there. If there's a person in front of me, I see that the person's in front of me and I can see their hands or they're getting out their checkbook or their, their credit mark card. Um, so it's just, just you're looking and making sure that things are normal. So that's relaxed 
alertness. Two, and I like it because it's like three, two, one, go. Um, two is I'm in the bank, the situation we talked about before. I'm, I'm in the bank and all of a sudden somebody walks in wearing unseasonably warm clothes, clothing. And I, and I look and I go, huh, this is odd. It's really hot outside. This person is wearing a, you know, a long, long coat. This is kind of odd. So that's, 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 that's specific alertness. I'm going to pay attention to that and I will decide how I'm going to handle it. Um, I, and in handling it, when you talk about lag time, I, I keep it simple. You know, I mean, I, I like to keep things like very, very much a switch. When I talk about handling it is like, am I going to handle it or am I going to disconnect from it? If I decide I'm going to handle it, it's going to be the manipulation of distance. Do I want to get closer to the potential target or do I want to put room between me and the target? If I say I'm going to disconnect from it, it means I'm going to get out. All right, no matter what decision I make, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it quickly. Um, and then say that same person with the, with the clothing, he starts sniffling or she starts sniffling, gets a handkerchief. He goes, ah, it's probably got a cold, but I still pay attention to it. But then all of a sudden they move and I see the, a butt of a gun. Then that's going to be targeted alertness. It still may not be an adversary, but they're certainly going to have my, my target alertness. The butt of the gun starts coming out and they yell everybody down. Then it's time to take action. What am I going to do? Am I going to get down? Am I going to beat feet? Or am I going to attack the opponent? So you, you scan, you assess, you respond, you assess. You know, and then you have to be realistic about your assessment skills. They got a gun and they're 15 feet away from me and I don't got a gun. I'm not really planning on charging them. I mean, unless they're just oblivious to my, my, my position. Um, if they've got a gun and they're three feet in front of me and they go for a gun, then there's certainly gun takeaway techniques that, that I could employ. So, but again, what, what's your moral code? Are you, are you ready to do that? And then that kicks back into what? Do, have I conducted a realistic assessment of my survival skills? Do I know for sure how long I could fight at a highly intense level regulating my tank because what if it goes the distance i mean what what if it goes the distance you know you hear these people and i hate saying it you know i've, I've heard it in you know in our art in capo because i don't have to be able to go four or five three four or five minutes because nobody could go 15 20 seconds with me with all due respect you don't know that if you go up against somebody that's equal to your skill set or somebody that's a good fighter, well, how can you make an assessment that you may, you may not have to push that to the mat? And, and like I said, when we started, remember that that faulty mindset is I never thought this could happen to me. What if you're highly skilled and you, and I mean, you truly are, and you could dismember most people within a matter of seconds. And you're confident in that. And you say, man, that's that. I'm never going to run into anybody that has that level of skill to take me to the distance. And then when you do, what's your mind going to say? I never thought this was going to happen. And that's it's funny you bring that up because say. you're here in chapter 10, you talk about all this. Two other factors uh, that are important for us to understand. We're talking about somebody that is not under the influence of some kind of medication or they have a mental dysfunction you know, deficiency of some sort, which like the gentleman you dealt with, that was just crazy. He just, he was psycho and he went off and, and we're there, but there's a and thing. he was skilled. Right. That guy had multiple black belts. He was skilled. He wasn't just a nut. He threw a kick over. He threw a kick one over the top of my head. I didn't have to duck. I mean, it wasn't the most accurate, but he was skilled. Well, so, you have to put your, your assessment to come up real quick, which probably brought you to the sixth sense that you talk about in chapter 10 and you say most women have a better understanding of that than men why don't you tell us about that yeah they do i think part of that is because guys tend to be a little bit more macho and um maybe a little bit bolder and how they they look at uh, potential adversarial situations um so most women have the ability, I won't say most, but I will say women have a, a higher, higher, a highly tuned ability 
um, to be able to respond to their sixth sense. You'll, you'll see often if you're in a room full of, of, of women and you ask them, how many of you have ever met a man and don't know why, but just as soon as you meet him, you go, this guy's a creep. You know, and actually my, my daughter, I, there was a, there was a, uh, an associate um, that I had known for a long time. And my, my daughter actually at the time who was 20, 19 or 20, looked at me and said, man, dad, that guy makes my skin crawl. He's a creep. And I went, ah, you're being kind of judgmental and blah, blah, blah. Well, later on, it turned out that she was 100% right. I hadn't picked up on it, but she completely picked up on it. Um, so women tend to have a more highly, I, I, I don't know if I'd say high, highly tuned, but they're more likely to respond to their sixth sense when men have a tendency to ignore it. And your sixth sense, there's really, all the sixth sense is, is, is your mind, if you want to say it from a secular standpoint, is your mind recognizes something in the environment that your conscious mind has not identified. So your subconscious mind or your soul has recognized something in the environment that your conscious mind hasn't recognized. And so I use an example in the, in the book. I was, I was uh, as a rookie officer, we were driving down the, the Harbor Freeway and my training officer, Greg Cowden, who was one of the best cops I ever worked with, we're driving down the freeway and he looks and he goes, hey man, we're gonna stop that car. And I said, why? And he said, man, the dude's hinky. He's hinky. Well, I knew I was gonna have to write the report and hinky doesn't cover probable cause. And I said, what do you mean hinky? He goes, I don't know, we're gonna stop the report. So we followed him for a while and he got, he got a, a, little, a little spooked and started laying straddling and then we lit him up and stopped him. Well, when we made the detention of the guy, when I went back, because I loved cars and I, and I loved going after cars, when we went back and I looked at the license plate number, I could see that one of the bolts on the frame of the license plate wasn't tight. It was, it was missing a bolt and another one was loose, indicating that the guy had put switch plates really quick. We ran the bin and the bin came back to a, to a stolen. You know, so now in, in Greg's mind, he just thought the guy was hinky. What more than likely happened is that we went by, he saw the license plate, but it didn't stick. He just said that guy is hinky. So we have the same things. And what I would encourage folks to do is when you have that, that feeling that something is wrong and your subconscious mind is saying something's wrong, respond to it. Respond to it. If you walk into a bank and you feel uncomfortable, make an assessment, scan, see if everything's right. And if you can't see anything going on, if you still feel that something's wrong, leave. Trust your instincts. You know, it's better to be safe than, than sorry. And I, like I say in the book, I think women have a tendency to be willing to respond to us. If, I think sometimes as, as men, our, our egos get in our way. You train, uh, you have your own school, correct, sir? I have a nonprofit school that I started in Hollywood um, in 1996 um, on Hollywood Boulevard that we focus on, develop uh, on services that we provide for, for um, some of the inner city kids that don't have the means to go to a traditional martial arts school. We use it to mentor kids to be able to help them develop into uh, successful people and in that process um, it's become an amazing school with multiple national and international champions multiple black belts that have gone on to graduate from law school and become attorneys and teachers and masters of public administration and yeah so yeah it was cool I, and you, i'm not as involved in it as i was at one point now it, there's a, a, a POW officer um, that runs it, that is an accomplished martial artist. He's actually a jiu-jitsuist. Um, so the school teaches um, Taekwondo. I have a black belt in Taekwondo. The school teaches Taekwondo. 
Uh, most of the students rank either comes from Taekwondo, Judo, or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but we certainly blend a lot of the Kempo self-defense techniques into it. So when they test for black belt, they have to know all of the traditional um, ITF Taekwondo forms and techniques and kicks, but there's also about 30 Kempo techniques that, they're, that they learn and they learn quite well. Um, and a, a lot of jujitsu and judo. And then we have some of them that have got their black belts underneath the ta taekwondo system that have went on to get their black belts in, in judo. We don't have any. You still train with Mr. White? I do, I do. Almost every Friday I was down there, Saturday for a black belt test and Friday for, for a private. He's been my, I started Kempo in 19, was 70 for a short period of time in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I started with the Tracy's underneath Roger Green, and it was just a short period of time. We ended up moving back to uh, California. I started with the Ed Parker uh, IKKA school in Anaheim with uh, Fred Brewster and Tony Sartor and Pierre Berger. And then um, I, I got in a, in a, I was, sparring with one of the black belts and it got pretty heavily carried away as a blue belt and I, I got told that I needed to apologize to the black belt and my my ego at that time wouldn't let me so I, I well, got kicked out of the school tell? and I had just lost a, to Dave Brock in a tournament and I was always aware of Mr. White's fighters because I always ended up fighting them in the finals and so I, I went down to Mr. White's and I said hey can I start here in this stitch? You're welcome. That was in 1972, and I've been there ever since. And talk about some of the um, the tournaments that you fought in, and on some of the teams. Well, I, you know, we we were really um, back in the day. Um, we were very involved in the internationals, and then in the California State Karate Championships, where were two really really hard fights, uh, hard tournaments to fight. Um, so we won the state championship several times. Um, I always enjoyed the team matches more. The individual fighting is great, but I always enjoyed the, uh, the team matches, just the excitement of it. Um, and then I was on the 1997 international um, black belt team, which was after Mr. Parker had died, obviously, but it was still a very heavy, solid tournament at that time. And then uh, I was on the black belt team with Jamie Matthews and John Sherholtz. And then two guys that weren't Kempo guys, uh, Joey Escobar and Johnny Gyro. And so I always, you know, I always wanted to win black belt team. And I, I make a joke of it. And I just kept doing it until everybody else died. So, <laughs> no, but it was, it was a real great tournament, actually. We had a lot of fights and it was, it was a good tournament. I fought off and on up through about 2000, I think my last tournament was 2010. And what happened is I was fighting for first place in a smaller tournament up in uh, Alhambra. And the guy I was fighting was a Taekwondo guy. He landed a, a, a good head kick on me and, and got up on points. And I responded with a, with a real heavy left hand body punch. And I remember his eyes just going like this and holding his ribs. And I, I realized that I had just changed. You know, I, I, I just didn't want to have to hit people that hard to win a trophy. I said, I'm, you're all done now. You know, I, I would have had to change the entire way that I competed in tournaments to continue. I thought personally that it was a whole lot more exciting and realistic when they got rid of the leg sweeps and the ability to be able to grab and because that's more realistic and then the going kicks you know so that that kind of to make that a gen i was getting older you know so to make that adjustment i just wasn't willing to put the time in to do it so i, I basically stopped you know but i had some good matches i fought darnell garcia i fought nasty anderson you know i got to go up against a lot of the bk guys uh, the two hardest matches i had frankly i lost both of them i lost to Darnell and Steve Anderson both in overtime. They were great matches, uh, but you know, they best in there. Now, since your retirement from law enforcement, you still compete and train with uh, your sidearm, correct? 
Yeah, I, I, com I compete in, in uh, I, I did it for a while. I've always shot, you know, and then I just got back into competition again. So I'm shooting in three gun matches, which you use a sidearm, a rifle, and a shotgun. Uh, and then I'm also competing in uh, action pistol, USPSA uh, action pistol. And I'll be shooting in my first IDPA, uh, Defensive Pistol Association match. So yeah, I shoot a few thousand rounds a month. Um, you brought so up one of the references of uh, the famed uh, 1911 instructor. I'll leave his name if you want to bring it up. And uh, Cooper. Exactly. And what you learned from that training and how it can apply also to your martial arts. Well, shooting at, at a high level is for all intents and purposes of martial art. I mean, you're, you have to control your your timing, your distance, your stance, your body movements, you have to regulate your breathing, um, your ability to simultaneously do things with different aspects of your body. So especially if you look at things like shooting on the move, if you're shooting on the move, literally moving and walking at a very, first pe a very fast pace and bringing up a gun sight and being able to get a good focus gun sight and hold that while you fire, while you're while you're walking, and those movements are martial arts, are martial arts movements. You know, I mean, you're, you're, you lower your body height. You know, we always talk in Kempo's lower your body height, you're talking like you're underneath a roof where you got a book on your head. So you lower your body height. So when you bring that gun up to your, to your eyesight, you don't have this, this bouncing and you basically disconnect your upper body from your lower body. Um, and so it gives you that ability to do that. So shooting some of the best shots that I know are very accomplished martial artists. It's not uncommon at all. Not all, but some of the best ones that I know. Let us, let's, well, one more question, and then I'm gonna ask our viewers to be ready to ask some questions of you. And I'm just gonna ask you about you. What do you feel in your life has been your greatest accomplishment? Hmm. I have two amazing children, you know, um, they're just amazing kids. I, I have lifelong friends, you know, Mr. White, um, so many, you know, lifelong friends that I've known for decades and decades. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't look at anything that I've been blessed with as an accomplishment that I have achieved, you know, and I try to be a good steward of the gifts that God has given me. Um, you know, I mean, he gave me an incredible work ethic. He gave me an incredible drive. Um, so yeah, I don't want to take credit for any of that. I mean, I, I could go through a list of stuff, you know, but you know, I have three black belts. I'm, I'm a three strike brown belt in jujitsu. You know, I'm, before the pandemic, I was probably eight, nine months away from getting my Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. Maybe, <laughs> you never know. Um, but, you know, I just try to be a good steward of the gifts that God has given me and the greatest blessing, you know. You know, we come into this life with nothing and we leave with nothing. And I think our, what we do to make an indelible impression on the people that we love and the world around us is, is uh, is the best that we could do. So if you look at things like martial arts skills or martial arts rank or shooting competitions or I don't know financial status or being a police captain, you really have to ask yourself, is all that important? You know. So I always ask myself, who is my? What is my identity? You know, and my identity is that, you know, I love the Lord. The Lord blessed me um, with, with the gifts of his son. And he blessed me with two amazing children and just some awesome friends. I mean, I've got friends that, that would go to the gates of hell and kick down the door and leave with me. You know, I mean, so if I had to say it's an accomplishment, it's the depth of my relationships that I think is, pleases me the most. You know what, sir, I would bet if we were to speak to your children, they would say you're the most amazing dad. If we speak to your friends, 
they would depends probably on, say, depends on the moment when you ask them. It, well, you know, they're <laughs> children. You talk to your friends, they said you're an incredible human being. And uh -huh. for us, you know, you've, you're accomplished when you say you came here with nothing, you leave us nothing. I disagree. I think you've created a lot of beautiful, perfect moments, as I call it. You're an author, highly respected martial artist, and a, just a genuine good person. And God had a plan for you. And we're so uh -huh. happy you could be here for us. Uh -huh. So let's have some questions uh, from the people that have been hearing, waiting patiently. And I'm going to start first with Zach Ricarder. Zach, why don't you unmute yourself? Say hello to our Hall of Fame member, Mr. Ron Sanchez. How you doing, Mr. Sanchez? Been uh, great. Just interview. call me Ron, please. Nice to nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you, Ron. Uh, you talk a lot about mindset, and uh, I preach uh, the same thing. But what I'm really interested in, also too, is you talked about predators and victims. What are the predators looking at in their victims? Is there any specific thing if they're not afraid? You know, they look for the path of least resistance, you know, is, is, is what they what they look for. They're, they're, they want to get in, get out, and be as successful as possible. So they most, the vast majority, look for the path of least resistance. I mean, the very, very, there's elite levels of predators. I don't like that word, but there's elite levels of predators, you know, the, I mean, the really professional skilled guys that train. Um, they train for what they're going to do. They practice, they rehearse, they train, they have skills. Um, but the vast majority of them look for the path of least resistance to go in and go and get out real quick. So they look to see if you're alert, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're formidable, if you look formidable, if you're paying attention to your environment, um, or if you're clueless to your environment. You know, if you're walking down the street with thinking about a bad marital situation or a bad financial situation and you're on the cell phone, you're going to draw their attention. Um, if you're walking down the street head up and you look physically fit and you look like you're paying attention, they may pick somebody else. Not necessarily for sure, but I'd say they look for the path of least resistance. The easy target. So, so much uh, body language uh, in my field. Uh, I project a different image when I'm behind my bar. Sometimes I, uh, customers get confrontational it's, and I'm just really calm and it's my body language and it usually diffuses the situation pretty easily. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Um, Thank you, Zach. Really appreciate you coming on. And let's move on down here and we're going to go to Dennis Knatzer. Dennis, how you doing, sir? Where are you? Can you say hello? To Ron Sanchez, you both know each other well. Hi, Ron. Uh, great hearing from you. you. You've always been an inspiration and a uh, a very kind person to me in person. And uh, I appreciate you, everything you've done and accomplished. Uh, uh, you're, you're well accomplished. Uh, you continue to train in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Hopefully, you'll get that black belt soon. And uh, okay. that, that's quite an. You've got it already. No, no. Someday I will. Oh, I yeah, won't quit. Yeah. I don't know when it'll come. Yeah, I'll either get it or God will call me home first, but I won't quit. Well, that's a great attitude, and that's part of your attitude. That, that That's great. So I wish I would have known you better. Uh, we've only, you know, interacted a few times, but it's always been uh, a professional and, uh, you know, very cordial. And uh, I, I, I'd like to ask you, you know, I, and I don't want to get political with this thing, but what do you think about this current status today? I, I, I'm really... You know, I'm really a Blue Lives Matter advocate, uh, you know, person. Uh, what, what, what's your feelings on, uh, you know, better training and, and uh, situation? Like some of these guys are really not real police, but, you know, they're, they're actors. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, I think, abusing their, their uh, office. You know, I mean, it's a... It's a uh... We have to be careful as martial artists, as Christians, as full-grown men and women to not broad brush stroke entire professions, entire ethnicities, genders, and um, 
there, I mean, even civil rights lawyers that make a living out of suing police departments um, will say that 97% of police officers do a great job, of law enforcement officers do a great job. Um, and I think that's probably a little higher. Um, but I also work, did a long tour of internal affairs. Um, and I investigated police officers some, for some pretty horrible things. Um, so police officers come out of society. Society is not perfect. So it would be naive to think that there aren't police officers out there that aren't professional, that don't uh, hold up to their oath of office, that shouldn't be officers. But the vast majority are out there and they truly have a good heart and they're trying to serve the community. Some of the things that are going on are problematic. Um, there's a big push nationally now um, to bar lateral neck restraints or carotid holds completely, where you can't use a carotid technique at all, even in deadly force. That to me is just insanity. Now there is a legitimate argument that says it should be restricted to those situations where deadly force is authorized. Right. There's a legitimate argument for that. And the argument is, is if you get that training when you're in the academy and you don't go to ongoing training about how to do your defensive tactics that includes the use of carotid restraints, it could be a very dangerous hole um, if it's applied incorrectly or if you don't get the person into a recovery position right away. Um, but I mean, I've been doing jujitsu now seven years this time and four years before, I had three years before, so about 10, 11 years. I, I've lost consciousness in, in jujitsu training. You know, once as a blue belt at John Jock Machado's, once as a uh, purple belt at my current school that I've been at seven years at Sensei Paulo Giovanni's. And I, in the world championships, I had to tap when I was competing in the finals. The guy got me. And if I wanted to tap, I would have lost consciousness. But I didn't get hurt. You said you were gonna tap I didn't get hurt. But I'm going with people that spend a lot of hours on the mat all the time. And so if you have a technique like a carotid restraint, if your organization does a lot of ongoing training with it, then I think it should be allowed for assaultive combative conditions. All right. If they don't do the training, I still think it should be allowed for lethal force situations because it, may, it defies logic that there's ever a situation that it's okay to shoot somebody with a nine millimeter or 40 cal or a 45 caliber pistol, but you can't put a, a, a carotid restraint on them. So, you know, we've got to step back and look at things from an analytical perspective and say, what is the associated risk with our defensive tactics and not from a political climate that says no matter what, they can never do that. Yeah, sorry to put you on such a... Sorry to put you on such a tough subject, but uh, yeah, what a great answer. Uh, I, I thoroughly agree with you. And uh, keep up the, the good work and anybody that you deal with and, and uh, keep your attitude going. Uh, you're a real treasure. No, thank you. Good to see you, sir. Thank you, Dennis. Let's move on over here to Todd Durgan. Todd, how you doing? Hello, Todd Durgan. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ron Sanchez, sir, it's a pleasure to see you. Hi, right, sir. Glad to see you. Glad to see you well and healthy. We uh, before, we had the pleasure and fortune to have him up here at the at the house and stay with us for a couple of days when we were uh, doing a fundraiser for Mr. White. Uh, so always great to see you, sir. And, and I, I have been to a few of his seminars, and uh, I got to tell you, some of the best seminars I've ever been to with regards to uh, actual 
real life awareness and situational training. So thank you, Todd. Appreciate that. Well, let's go to the other end. Let's talk to Greg Hildebrandt. Greg, how you doing, buddy? Hello, Mr. Sanchez. How are you, sir? Hi, sir. Um, uh, I, I was in corrections and, uh, 14 years in corrections and two years of parole probation before I decided to take early retirement. <laughs> so, and, re and reinvent service. myself and get into other, some, some other career fields. So a lot of what you said, I identify with a hundred percent, um, spot on. I've been reading your book. Uh, I don't really have any questions per se. Uh, most of the, uh, the one question I had was, was, uh, Mr. Knasser kind of touched on, but, uh, basically what I, Want to do is just thank you for your time here because it does a lot of validation on what I've trained to do, my mindset, my pre preparedness. Uh, I, I really what gravitate, what attracts me to your book a lot. What what I found myself attracted to in your book was the spiritual aspect, and that uh, I find that that's a huge gaping lack in a lot of people's training, and so. Maybe that has a lot to deal with uh, con uh, contributing to uh, failures and in, in, in the confrontations, you see. Uh, like you say, you talk about de-escalation. Uh, I find a lot of times that the skill set for de-escalation is not used, but they're more pro escalated to a point where they, could, their idea of controlling the situation is escalated to the point of confrontation and then win in the confrontation. But uh, Anyways, I don't really have any question. Just want to say thank you so much, and I appreciate your book. I've really been enjoying it, and uh, I enjoy these sessions, and thank you guys for letting me be here. Thank you, Greg. I really appreciate that. Let's go over now to Bob White. Hello, Bob. How you doing, sir? Ron Sanchez, how are you? I'm good, sir. How are you? Well, I'm doing great. Just uh, enjoying it. You know, I've said for years, you've been my student for 47 years but I continually learn things from you. Uh, your seminars, I've, I've watched a lot of seminars throughout the years, and I really don't think that I've heard one that is more beneficial to students than to listen to what you have to say. Well, thank you. Well, you've influenced uh, a lot of us so much throughout the years. In fact, when you opened your nonprofit school, you've influenced so much. Now we're all on nonprofit. <laughs> yeah, the difference is mine was by by intention yeah exactly ours is not by choice but it is certainly a reality but thank you you know I, i'm so happy that people had an opportunity to listen to what you have to say i hope they pursue it further by getting your book but um it's just a, a great service you know you've lived for years in the los angeles police department with the protect and serve and and I know you pretty well. You're one of my closest friends, and, and you live your life like that. You protect and serve, and you help people, and that's such an admirable quality, and just proud to have you as a friend. I'm proud to be your student. Thank you, sir. Thank you, All Mr. Right. White. That was really, I appreciate you coming on. You know, guys, it has been a, an amazing, amazing afternoon here with Mr. Sanchez. He is an incredible individual. He is an author. Highly decorated police officer, well-established, respected martial artist. He does train to ensure that things will go well for him. And we look forward to hearing more from him and in, in over the years to come. Ron, honestly, I've spent a lot of time on the phone with you. You're an amazing guy. Thank wow. you so much for coming on here. And now I'm going to open this up so everybody can say goodbye to you. Uh, and thank you very much for coming on here, sir. You truly were, it was really an honor. God bless you. Hey, Ron. Christy says hello, by the way. I didn't get to oh, squeeze that out. Right. And thank you for your service. All right, I said hello. Thank you. Ron, I enjoyed listening to you. I always do. And I thank you so much for what you give. And uh, most of all, your friendship to me, but mostly to my husband. I really appreciate it. I know that you're always there for him. And that speaks so highly for me. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Williams. And thank you for your service, Ron. Oh, thank you. It, was my, it truly was my pleasure. So on behalf of the Kempo Karate Hall of Fame, thank you, Ron Sanchez. Until we see each other again, God bless you, and we will look forward to seeing you in the near future. Good night.
Thank you. God bless everybody. God bless.